up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 498. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, you ready to cover some M20? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, look the, the, the fact that uh, M20 and Modern Horizons came out at essentially the same time from my point of view is <laughs> a, little, a, little, a, little, a little rough, but uh, I, I'm actually really excited to cover M20. I think that... Uh, this set just looks really sweet, and it's kind mm-hmm. of uh, you know even from just looking at the, the 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 spoiler, it's kind of blown out of the water my expectations when it comes to corset. Like I think this corset's going to be awesome. Yeah, traditionally we think of these as a bit of a palette cleanser, and it might even be considering the sets that we're coming off of. But still, it's got a lot going on, and uh, we're going to be jumping into every single common and uncommon in the set on this one. This is, of course. The big set review. Before we get into it, though, we've got to mention our sponsor, ChannelFireball.com. That's the place to go for all things magic related on the internet. Hey, if you want to get M20 right now, you can go pre order it on Channel Fireball. And once they're able to ship it to you, it'll be in the mail and you'll get it in your hands and you can draft it with your friends or, or do whatever. While you're there, you can pick up awesome stuff like A, well, you can get uh, singles and sealed product like M20 or whatever it else it is that you need. You also can get uh, supplies and you can get content by some of the best content creators on the internet for magic uh, right there on the front page for free on channelfireball.com. We do thank them for their sponsorship. Also, newsletters. Luis, there's three now? Yeah, we've got uh, three newsletters. So speaking of content, you get to opt into the the, the content you want. And this content can't be found anywhere. But the newsletter, we've got uh, myself. I write a newsletter every Wednesday. Uh, we've got Matt Nass. He's writing the modern newsletter. We just kicked that off. And every week, Matt's going to find a pretty sweet modern brew or invent one. And he'll, he'll tell you all about that. And then on Friday, we've got the commander newsletter by the one and only Eric Levine. So I've been really happy with how the newsletters have come out. Uh, I think it's kind of cool getting this like bite-sized bit of content. I look forward to the newsletters I'm signed up for. And uh, I'd urge you to go to channelfireball.com slash newsletter and you sign up for any and all of the newsletters. So I would, of course, recommend all of them. Though. Don't don't tell Matt his newsletter is good. He doesn't need that. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of good info, even some extra promos and stuff in those new letter, newsletters. So do check those out. If you want to support the show directly, if you found this show useful, if it's made your life a little better, if you like – hanging out with us once every week. You want to make sure that we keep doing it. Patreon.com slash limited resources. You can get some cool bonuses there as well that are exclusive to patrons. And a lot of it is just access to the feed where we ask questions or allow you to ask us questions directly. I've really been thinking about uh, donating to the Patreon so I could get access to it since... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you have to. <laughs> yeah, I hope I hope that uh, many of our listeners have also been thinking about doing the same thing. Well, so I mean, Patreon.com I mean, slash. You know, j- jokes stuff. aside, I, I think Patreon is awesome because it really does help you support the content you like to see. You know, you, you, you mm-hmm. don't you don't you don't have to. You know, we're overjoyed if you just want to listen to the podcast. You're you're you are definitely supporting us by doing that. Patreon can really help you help support any of the content creators, us or other people that are, are doing the stuff that you know, you think is awesome and you want to see more of. That's exactly it. Um, okay, so first things first, Luis, before we get into the cards, we're going to be starting with the gold uncommons. These are our signpost uncommons. They help us get an idea for we, what each color pair is doing. But we need some context here. L- give us the uh, grading scale overview. All right. So uh, we're going to go uh, with letter grades. We're going to start at A's. These are bombs, game winners, cards that are good in many situations, especially when behind, and just the best cards in the set. Cards like Nissa, Ugin, God Eternal, Oketra, etc. Next up, we've got Bs. These are cards that actively pull you towards their colors, headliners for a set, and reasons to be in a particular color pair when you're talking about something like M20. So these are uh, cards like Mao Loyal Companion, Leyline Prowler, Ugin's Conjurant, Flux Channel, are just solid good cards. Uh, C's are playable. These are the pawns of limited. These are the cards you have to fill out your deck with. And they're cards that you're not unhappy to be playing. You're just not overjoyed to be playing. So these are cards like Tamio's Epiphany, Enforcer Griffin, uh, even Eternal. D's are sometimes playable, but you'd prefer not to run them. Every time you put a D in your deck, you, you kind of wince a little bit. So these are cards like Charity Extractor, Ironclad, Crovod, Ward Scale, Crocodile. Fs are, as you'd expect, un- virtually unplayable in all scenarios. Cards like Demolish, Arboreal Grazer, just the bottom of the barrel. We also have two subcategories. We've got Sideboard. These are cards that don't 
ever make or rarely make the main deck, but it can be quite powerful out of the sideboard and deserve a higher grade as a result. Cards like Force Landing, Return to Nature, Topple the Statue. These are cards that when you put them in your deck, they're good, but you just don't start them. And then lastly, we've got Build Arounds. These are cards that by themselves don't actually do much or aren't good enough, but if properly supported, they can be great. Cura, Behemoth Beckoner, uh, Sahili, Sublime Artificer, even Karn the Great Creator. These are uh, examples of cards that on their face don't do as much, but uh, with the right support, you know, can be quite strong cards. And that brings us to black. So our first card is called Agonizing Siphon. It is three and a black for a sorcery. A common Agonizing Siphon deals three damage to any target and you gain three life. This is what Lightning Helix costs when it's not gold. And pushed and uncommon. <laughs> and sorcery. Yeah, I, I, I think Agonizing Siphon is a fine card. The, the, the fact that you gain three makes up for how clunky it is. It's the same as, um, you know, the angel we were talking about earlier. They, yep. You know, the, the four and a white, three, two flying gain four. Mm -hmm. Like, it's funny because life gain intrinsically isn't that valuable. We just, you know, crapped on Soul Mender and we always talk about how one mana gain fours are just not good. But mm -hmm. life gain on a rider or as a rider on a card that does something makes it so those cards can be a little clunkier and still be worth it because the life gain kind of insulates you. So that's right. Yeah. Even though, if, so Agonizing Siphon, if it were three and a black deal three, we would kind of reluctantly play it. I think with the game three, it becomes a card you're just happy to play as many copies as you can get. It's not the most efficient, but this is not a card you're going to turn down. Yeah, it's especially good against the small creature decks, of course, where the life gain swing matters and where you're more likely to be able to kill a reasonable threat. It doesn't kill a lot of green stuff, but still, whatever. Uh, keep in mind that it's a sorcery also, so this is not instant speed removal. Uh, that's another small knock on it. I don't, I'm don't. i not super high on Agonizing Siphon, but like you said, I mean, this is the type of removal that you're definitely going to play in your deck, and it's it's a common black removal spell you'll see quite a bit. So I, I think it's like a C+. Uh, you know, it's still removal. It's still, you know, rates higher than like an average creature, but it's, it's yeah, not. Yeah, that's amazing. exactly where I'd put it. It's, it's a C+. It's going to be one of the good black commons, not the best. Audacious Thief is next. It's two and a black for a 2-2. Two, two. It's a human rogue at common. Whenever it attacks, you draw a card and lose a life. Oh. Oh, I'm into this. Uh, oh. So it has cool. to survive to attack, you know, so it's not like quite as good as Frexian Rager uh, or, 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 you know, Blade Juggler where you just get the payment up front, essentially. Mm -hmm. But but mm -hmm. it has the dream. The dream is you get to attack twice with this. And and. Yes. Then you're really going off because imagine you play wow. turn three audacious thief and they play their creature and they have like two creatures in play and you're like angelic gift gets flying attack draw a card gain a life or sorry lose a life and then they're like oh crap you're going to do that every turn or you just pair mm -hmm. this with removal combat tricks whatever. Yeah they have to deal with it it's interesting because the natural comparison are to cards uh, you know aphidians we call them right cards that uh, when they hit your opponent they let you draw a card and typically these are two and a blue for a two, two or a one, three. Um, but those actually have to connect. So you need ways to really get creatures absolutely out of the way. All this has to do is attack. If they have an O four four wall, you can just keep drawing cards. If they have a one, three, you can just keep drawing. Even a one, two, you can just attack into it oh, and keep hey. drawing the cards. And even if it dies, you get the card. Right, so, so attacking into a two, two is a good deal for you because you traded and drew a card. And then even later in the game, you can send this in, you know, to certain death and still be okay with it because you got to draw your card out of your tutu. So, hmm. I like it. This is sweet. And 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 there's going to be games where it runs away with totally. the game, where you just play it on three and they don't have a thing. You're on the play, and you just start sending it in and getting your cards back. Wow, this is really powerful. Common. Do you like this at B minus? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean. I I feel like I mean it's it's all it, look it's going to die a lot but it's a must kill totally. that, that that means that it's it's really good so B minus for audacious thief good for you buddy uh, barony vampire is two and a black for a vampire at common it is a three two this looks like a D yep uh, straight up D I don't know if vampires matter but it's just uh, fringe playable if you need a body it's there otherwise not doing much uh, next is blade brand this is. Uh, one and a black for an instant at common. Target creature gains death touch until end of turn. Draw a card. Stupid blade brand. Oh, I mean, it doesn't have Footlight Fiend to pair with, but this was always an acceptable card. Uh, yeah, it, it really is. The fact that it replaces itself and lets you trade up is is fine. It's, it's playable. I, I, I still don't get excited about cards like this. If there's a combo with it where you can do a Footlight Fiend style thing where... 
uh, basically you can set up a, a situation where two creatures could conceivably die because of your blade brand or something, uh, you know, pretty consistent in that way. Then the card goes up a lot in value to me, but I have blade brand at like D plus. Like I, I just, I never look at this card and go, Oh, sick. Well, I, I got to play. I think it's more like a C minus there, there, there aren't as many good combos with this. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, your opponents aren't pressured to block quite as much as they were in Ravnica allegiance. Uh, so, mm-hmm. so I think that, I think that C minus is fine, but you're never like super unhappy. Okay. Yeah, I'll go D plus, you go C minus on Blade Brand. Next is Blight Beetle. It is one and a black for a 1-1 one, one insect at Uncommon. Here we go. It has protection from green and creatures your opponents control can't have plus one, plus one counters put on them. Yeah, this card is uh, quite a bit stronger and constructed than it is in Limited, but it's still mm-hmm. it's still a card I'd be interested in playing. This one, my... my my desire to play at main deck is lessened, right? This is not the same uh, yeah. as the as the two pious one. advocate, whatever, <laughs> uh, the 2-1 mm-hmm. pro black. Uh, but I, I think it would just this is just going to end up being an effective sideboard card. The anti-plus-plus-one plus one counters part is pretty small. It's mostly just if you're playing against green, a 1-1 one, one pro green is just so good at blocking their stuff. Yeah, I, I like it as a sideboard B or whatever, but sideboard card for Blight Beetle, but... It really is too big of a cost to pay a uh, two mana one one in your deck if if your opponent's not playing green. It is it is a disaster. I mean, the the plus one plus one counter thing might come up occasionally, but it doesn't seem to be a, a real shutdown mechanic there. So I like it against green and and not otherwise. Yep. Uh, for Blight Beetle. Next is Blood Burglar. This is a one and a black for a two two vampire rogue. It is common as long as it's your turn. Blood Burger <laughs> Burger Blood Burglar has very good. lifelink. Yeah, I'm hungry. <laughs> um, has lifelink. Yeah, I mean, a two-mana 2-2 two, two lifelink, even if it's only while it's attacking, still pretty good. I, I, I Th- That's when it really matters anyway, right? Like, most of the time. I mean, this look, there's going to be games where it's going to matter, where you're going to play this to yeah. block their 5-5, five, five, and you're going to be kind of out to life compared to uh, what okay, it would have been. Yeah. But, that's just such a minor thing. Because, you know, if, if, if your opponent's attacking into your lifelinker, they're, they're attempting to trade with it. It's not like they're sending their one, one into your life linker. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So you do miss that one shot when you block and your creature dies gain life, but otherwise all the life link comes from attacking anyway. So it's really not that big of no, a, I mean, anyway. and seems like I like this more than daybreak chaplain, the one, three life link, because a two, two life linker is better than a one, three life linker. Even if it's off half the time, that half of the time really ends up being like 20% of the time in terms of effective combats. So, exactly. So I like it. I, this seems like a solid. Yeah, it's scene. a C. It's not I, nothing special. Vampires but, might matter, but you know, it's yeah, decent. Blood burglar, the blood burger himself gets a C. Um, next is blood for bones. This is uh, three and a black for an uncommon sorcery. As an additional cost to cast it, sacrifice a creature. So we're at four mana sorcery speed, sack a creature. This better be good. Return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, then return another creature card from your graveyard to your hand. I, I, no, it is good. I like this card. It, basically, three to black return a creature from your graveyard to the battlefield is a fine card. Not like, you know, exciting, but it's fine. Straight up zombify. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But... Being able to sack your worst creature to get your you know second best creature back from your graveyard is upside. So mm-hmm. this is going to effectively be like a not quite a two for one, but like a one and a half for one because you can often sack something dorky or bad or even a token if you're really going for it and get back you know two good creatures and, and you get to put the more expensive one or whichever one you want into play right away and the other one goes back to your yeah. hand. So. Weird question, but can I no. can I get back the one? <laughs> I, can I not? It doesn't say target. Oh, and the things happen in order. Never mind. I was uh, I I I'd assumed it said target. Yeah, it just says return a creature from a graveyard to the battlefield. You could just use this to to blink because basically you pay for you yeah. sack a creature and then when this resolves, the creatures in the graveyard you get to choose creatures. All right, that's uh, that's weird. Surprising templating, but uh, good catch. And yeah, me too. It mm-hmm. means that if you have like let's say boneclad necromancer, the three three that makes a two two, you could just sack the mm-hmm. necromancer immediately get it back and get another 2-2 plus whatever else you want to do. Yeah, or you could be that one that goes to your hand if there's some other reason sure. for it. Blood for Bones, what do we give it? This, is, this seems powerful. I, think, I like it at B-. minus. I think that this card is going to be pretty good. Yeah, I do too, especially given that, you know, it, 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 at worst case, it's slowing you down. You do need to get a card in the a creature in the graveyard, and it is your graveyard, but still, that's that's very doable. 
B minus for blood for bones. Next is blood soaked altar. You mentioned this one earlier. It's four black black for an artifact and uncommon. Again, we you know this is something that they've done in the past, but these artifacts do have a color, which is kind of kind of interesting. Um, tap it, pay two life, discard a card, and sacrifice a creature. <laughs> Come on, this better be amazing. Create a five five black demon creature token with flying. You can only do this at sorcery speed. All right, that is kind of amazing. It's it's um, so when you look at a card like this, I think what you need, want to look at is at what point am I happy with this investment? Because a six mana five five flyer that makes you pay two life, discard a card, and sack a creature, not a good deal. Like that that would not be good enough. No. Like if if this was just four black black five five flyer, and then when it enters the battlefield, discard a card, pay two life, and sack a creature, you would look at that and be like, no way, I'm not in for that. Okay, so right. straight up, if this card makes one demon, not good enough. If it makes two demons, well, now you've gotten quite a bit out of it, but you still you're still down right. two cards, two creatures, and four life plus the altar itself. Mm -hmm. So, in order to break that symmetry, the the easiest part here, because the two life hard to get around, discarding a card also kind of hard to get around, is making the sack a creature part less costly. And the way to do that is tokens. Imagine blood soaked altar plus raise the alarm. You know, you end up sacking those two raise the alarm tokens, so you're down three cards plus the altar and four life, but you get two 5-5 five, five flyers out of the deal. And Yeah, and two 5-5 five, five ends the game very, very quickly yes. and tends to dominate the board. Yeah. Also, you do get to do it immediately, right? Yep. You you pay the six. It, it is you, only, the artifact can be used right away. It is only as a sorcery, no block sack nonsense. Yeah, no, you can't save your creatures or try to ambush anything, yeah. but... Gosh, I don't know. The, you know, it's funny because the part that I'm actually the most worried about is the discard a card just because this is a six mana card. Yeah, how many cards do you have left in your hand? It's not guaranteed you're going to have a lot. Yeah. The life matters too. This is a really, yeah, this is, it really does. It really does matter if you're, if you're in a race situation. You might be able to do the first one, mm. but it might get really sketchy there, to make the second demon, which is kind of where you want to be. Anyway. There is act of treason at common. Okay. So, yeah, that matters. Yeah. That absolutely You play this, matters. sack a creature, discard a card, pay two life, make a demon. Next turn, act of treason their creature, sack that to make a demon, and you're pretty far ahead at that point. And then you're done. Yeah, I mean, once you get two demons going, like, there's no reasonable attacks that most decks yeah. will have against you. You can close so up the, the game in a turn. I believe this is a build around. I don't think you could just put this in your average deck and be happy with it. It's good with that green block enchantment, the Moldervine Reclamation. Mm -hmm. Um it is. Because, you know, whenever you, you lose a creature, you draw a card and gain a life. So th this actually offsets yeah, so you get some, quite nicely. It, yeah, it does. <laughs> Down to just the one life. Um, gosh, this is actually really tough. Uh, my, my gut tells me that this is still going to be worth it just because the 5-5 five, five Flying Demon is, is probably going to be the best thing on the board. And the second one is going to close out the game kind of regardless of where you were at. Like you could, could even go quite low on life. And there's almost no card that you would draw off the top of your library each turn that you wouldn't prefer to just turn into a 5-5 five, five Flying Demon. Um, the harder parts, of course, are the sacrifice of creature as well. This is a huge cost to pay. I, I, I honestly don't know how good it's going to be, but I'm going to start out uh, high on it. I, I want to try it out, and I think it. I think that just demons so that, will win. The that's game a build around B. Then. Yeah, build around B. All right, I, I, I'm in for that. I think it's probably a little yeah. worse than that, but I think I'm, I'm willing to try it. It is a extremely high cost to pay. Um, next is bloodthirsty aerialist. This is one black black for an uncommon vampire rogue. So I guess vampires are a thing. The barony vampire might be a little better. Uh, anyway, this is one black black for a two three flying vampire rogue, and whenever you gain life, it gets a plus one plus one counter. Dang. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, black, white life gain. It, it, it's a, it's, it's a solid card. Um, I mean, you'd play one black, black, two, three flying most of the time. And if you have a incidental life gain or two, then this becomes very, very good. Yeah, for sure. Especially repeatable. You know, you, you, you line this up with the one, three life linker or something and just get a couple of counters. I mean, it really doesn't take much. Even one counter in this card is, is pretty busted. Also, there's there's the turns where you can like play that card I mentioned. What is it called? The Chaplain, Daybreak Chaplain? Mm -hmm. Play that. And then next turn, play Bloodthirsty Aerialist. If your mana cooperates, then well, just attack. Like, the I'll just go Blood you know, Burglar into that. It's, it's even better. Yeah, that's even cleaner. So there you go. Blood uh, Burglar, uh, Bloodthirsty Aerialist, attack with my Blood Burglar. I have a three, four, five. I think this is a B. It's, like, it's uh, just a straight B. Like, because yeah, most decks are going to have an easy way to gain life or two, and some decks will have three or four, and then all of a sudden you're really getting there. Um, one right. note before we move on, 
The only card that cares about vampires that I can see is Soren mm-hmm. at Mythic. So, Ow. so I don't. F- so this is just flavorful, just like well, black creatures. There, well, it's, it's like there's a bunch stuff. of vampires in the set, which makes constructed uh, a little more interesting oh, okay. with like Soren. But, but as a theme at common and uncommon, uh, I'm not really seeing it. Okay. And okay, yeah, I don't. I don't even Good think there's know. a colorless card. I guess there's a rare that get, you know rewards you for having creatures of the same type. But yeah, for the most. Yeah. So we're talking about a, a rare and a. Yeah, for the most part, right. vampires don't matter. Um, Okay. What do we got next uh, year? Next Bone Splinters. Bone Splinters. Yeah, what does it's, that one do? That's it's a reprint from Shards of Lard's Black. It's a sorcery. As an additional cost to cast the spell, sack creature, destroy target creature. So strictly worth Spark Harvest for those of you who enjoyed playing with that mm-hmm. in uh, War of the Spark. Yeah, Bone Splinters, the way it ends up is in a deck that's equipped to use it, which is tokens, creatures with death effects, uh, you know, fodder of, of various kinds. It's a good card. In a, creature, in a deck that's not, it's just not very good because... Imagine a normal deck where you're like, play a two drop, play a three drop, play a four drop. Then you have bone splinters in your hand. You're like, I guess I could sack my two drop to kill their four drop, but I'm down a card. That that's just not very good. So, yeah. I th- and also they they don't scale well. Like you don't want them in multiple. No, you tend not to. Uh, so I think bone splinters is going to end up getting a C minus. But yeah, but in a deck with like sanitarium skeleton, that's another common. Uh, raise the alarm, like cards like that. Then bone splinters can can go up to like a B. Because if it, if you can effectively subsidize the cost, it is one mana kill a creature. Yeah, it is really powerful. It just costs you so much to do it. On board, mana invested presence. <laughs> that is a, that is the one of the steepest costs yeah. you can pay in, in limited. So, so C minus for bone splinters. It is classic. Um, you know, you do what you got to do style removal. Uh, what about bone clad necromancer? What does that guy do? My job's not really to read cards, and I already just read bone splinters. So. So do you want me to read it then? No, I'll, I'll do it, but I'm doing you a favor. You, you, you'll, oh, okay, I, I owe you one. Three black black for a 3-3. Three, three. <laughs> it's a human wizard at common. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you may exile target creature card from a graveyard. And if you do, you make a 2-2 two, two black zombie. It's really powerful if, if you get to do the ability and really not if you now, don't. At five mana, I would expect there to be a creature in a graveyard. It, it, it's a right. bit of a cost if you sense. have to exile your own. You know, there are multiple raised deads in the set. But yeah, I like Boneclad Necromancer. It gets a little worse in multiples because they, they, they all feed on the same pool of resources. But I think playing like two of these is still going to be pretty good. It, it just five mana for five, five worth of stats, plus broken up over two pieces. Plus, if you get the, the Necromancer back somehow, you get to re-trigger it. Like, that. that's all pretty good. So I, I, so it's Grave Titan is what you're saying. Yeah, basically. I, I would give Boneclad Necromancer yeah. a C+. Plus. Yeah, me too. This seems to be the type of effect black one. So C plus for bone clad and necromancer. Next is really good removal spell. Um, and it looks like it has now been bumped to uncommon. It's disfigure. And please, the the witch figure jokes are going to have to like. Yeah, those, those are done. Like, we're, we're, we're canceling those. Those are, those are over. Black for an instant uncommon target creature gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. It's just a classic B minus because even yeah, though the effect really doesn't cool. look huge, first of all, one mana to kill any two toughness creature at instant speed. That's good. Second, this actually combines well in combat. You can your three three rumbles with their four four. All of a sudden, it's a two two, and you win. So that's right. This figure just trades up on mana, and you know is is, is always going to be effective. So uh, B minus yep. for disfigure. B minus for disfigure. Take them, play them. You'll love it. Uh, next is duress printed for the millionth time. It's black for a sorcery. It's common. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-creature, non-land card from it. That player discards that card. Uh, I typically never main deck these and occasionally sideboard them. Uh, but even then, I'm reluctant to to even sideboard. Them. So the risk the risk of having this card, of course, is that you draw it on turn seven and your opponent has no no spells in their hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yes, I would never main deck this. I would look to sideboard it in against opponents who have you know in your estimation. Slightly less than half their deck is spells, so we're talking like 10, 12 spells, and you know, of you know, not not counting lands, of course, and that they have some expensive ones or counter spells, because those were where duress is, you know, especially effective. So yes, yes. It's just a sideboard card, you know, it's like a sideboard C. It's not even that special. Like I like negate quite a bit more because you don't miss with negate. It sits in your hand until you get to use it. And, you know, when they play a non-creature spell, you get to use it. Whereas duress, you just sometimes fire it off and their hand is easily just three creatures. 
Yeah, and then they draw the thing that they needed, and then it's uh, it's bad news for yeah. you. The other thing to consider with duress is there is some interesting gameplay with it. It's usually not correct to fire it off on turn one. Usually you want to wait until the turn before the card that you care about matters. Uh, for example, if you board it in against a five-mana spell, you'd want to do that on turn four to maximize the chances of nabbing it. And the other thing you want to do with it, which Luis alluded to, was clear the way for counterspells if your opponent's playing a very counterspell-centric deck. So. Yeah. So sideboard for dress. Uh, Epicure of Blood is next. It is four and a black for a 4-4 four, four vampire at common. And whenever you gain life, each opponent loses one life. This card's pretty powerful in the if you have repeatable life gain sources. It actually adds up pretty quickly. And you're getting spotted a 4-4 four, four for five, which is acceptable anyway. Uh, Epicure generally is a C. It's probably a C plus or a little better in the um, in the life gain decks. But you really do need to build it, yeah, build it towards actually- that. I kind of have it at C minus right now because I think the life gain decks are pretty light. So mm-hmm. this isn't like uh, M19 where you could often play this because you had a bunch of other life gain stuff going on more more regularly. But really, I feel like we've seen quite a bit. I mean, there's the. I mean, if you want to do it, there's the Soul Mender or whatever that thing's called. The, yeah, I don't really want to do that the, though. The, the, I don't either. But I mean, I'm saying like if you build a dedicated life gain deck with two Epicures and two of those, you know, you can kind of start going off. Yeah, All right, well, I'm at I, C. You're at C- minus for Epicure. Yeah. It, it has a build around nature to it. You can put it in a regular deck, but it's it really underperforms a bit there. But um, yeah. Oh, they printed this again. Fathom Fleet Cutthroat. Three and a black for a human pirate at common. It is a 3-3. Three, three, so four mana, 3-3. Three, three. And when it enters a battlefield, destroy target creature, an opponent curls, controls it was dealt damage this turn. This card actually does work. It's it's especially good with small tokens. You know, you you yes. you you cast your raise the alarm and you play the two two and you attack everything into your opponent's four four. They're often going to block, and then you just get to to cut them down here. Yeah. yeah, and and by the way, this is like the face up. <laughs> your opponent attacks a one one into your four four, and you're like, what? And it's like they have fathom fleet cutthroat if they're in black. That is exactly what they're doing. Oh yeah. So this is the kind of card that I think is a C. But it's going to play as like a D against someone who's very wary, and, you know, and more skilled and experienced. And it's going to play as like a B against someone who's not thinking about it. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. So averages out to a C for Fathom Fleet Cutthroat. Feral Abomination is five and a black for a five five thrill at common, and it has Death Touch. Not a, not a huge fan of this card. I mean, it, it's not that it's not playable. You can put it in your deck if you need a six, but. Death Touch uh, on huge creatures, it doesn't scale beautifully. Sure, if they want to double block, then they lose both of their creatures no matter what, which is a nice bonus. But, um, you know, I I would prefer any type of evasion, for example, on my five-powered creature that already has five toughness anyway. It's already a great blocker. Uh, I think Pharaoh Abomination's a D. It's just a type of card that makes a cut yeah. sometimes. Yeah. I, I played it every now and then in Dominaria, but not 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 a, not a huge fan. So D for Feral Abomination, which brings us to Gorging Vulture. Like that was this you one. before the show. Oh, yeah. We, we, <laughs> we got on a call a little early, and I was definitely gorging on some cornflakes. <laughs> but corn, corn, look, cornflakes just aren't that, like, heavy or rich of a food. Can you really gorge yourself on cornflakes? <laughs> it would take a lot. Yeah, it would take yeah, a lot. Yeah, I mean, I was trying, but... <laughs> uh, so, Gorging Vulture is two and a black for a 2-2 flying bird at common. When it enters the battlefield, you put the top four cards in your library into your graveyard and then gain a life for each creature card you put in your graveyard this way. So, Okay. In a deck with like, you know, 15 creatures or something like that, you're going to gain a slightly more than a life every time you do this. And it's a three mana 2-2 flyer. That seems fine to me. It does to me too. It has uh, minor sub themes with some graveyard stuff. It's great in your, in your five Epicure of Blood deck that you're yeah, you know, hell yeah. bent on drafting oh, here. We're up to five now. Yeah, uh, but but also, um, you know, its baseline stats are pretty acceptable. A three mana two two flyer is totally fine. So it, I think there's just a lot good going on here. And it stacks your graveyard. Uh, you know, Soul Salvage is back. Grave Digger's back. Mm-hmm. So you're definitely gonna the, feel the, feel feel like it's an upside to just be milling yeah. yourself for four. And two cards that we are interested in, the Blood for Bones and the Bone Clan Necromancer also care. So, yeah, yeah I think the Vulture is probably quite good. I, I would give Gorging Vulture a C+. Plus. Me too. It just seems like a good enabler on a solid body. Um, uh, next, you mentioned it, Gravedigger. Yeah, this is a three and a black for a 2-2 zombie and uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you may return to our creature card from your graveyard to your hand. This card uh, has Super been a mainstay good. since, like, Tempest. And... Yeah. It, so good, it, you know. It got upgraded to uncommon at some point in the in in the, the lost in the sands of time. 
but yeah, that was a good move. Gra- Magic 2015. Yeah, this card's definitely uncommon power level. Gra- Grave Digger is just a straight B. Like, it, it may not look super impressive, but the fact that you're getting a straight up two for one, you're getting your best creature back to a graveyard, and if you have ways to recycle Grave Digger, then you're just getting value on top of value. Classic B for Grave Digger. Maybe the definition of a B. Um, what about Gruesome Scourger? This is a three black black for a three three orc warrior at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, it deals damage to target opponent or planeswalker equal to the number of creatures you control. Weird. So basically, this comes down, and unless they have a planeswalker, which you know doesn't happen very often, it probably nugs your opponent for like minimum one because it counts itself, and right. you know probably around three or four damage. That's pretty good, actually. That yeah. that actually adds up quite a bit. It also gives you access to some game plans that are. Uh, oh yeah, you know, you, where you can hold it in your hand and wait till you draw a couple extra creatures to just right. Kill them you get or, your opponent to eight. You play this, nug them for four. You chump block with it. You soul salvage it, and they're dead. Yeah, exactly. It's really good with raised deads. It's good with a go wide deck for so black white actually looks like it's got some some real real action going on. Yeah, it really I, does. I think gruesome scourge is probably going to end up being like a B minus. Yeah, I do too. Let's just give it a B. I, like th- this, you know, three three for five is not great, but doing th- this this thing scales up with the game in a really nasty way. Yeah, I like yeah. B for Gruesome Scourger. Works for uh, me. Mm-hmm. Brings us to Mind Rot. That's uh, two to black. It's a sorcery at common. Target player discards two cards. So where these cards always end up, because we see Mind Rot almost every set or some variant thereof, is about half the time you main deck it, half the time you sideboard it, and you're pretty happy to play it in like sealed. Mm-hmm. So that, yeah. that's like that's a C minus, it. you know? Yeah, it's a C minus for Mind Rot. It may be a D plus. It's just a, one of those fringe the, playables. The, the slower the format is, the better Mind Rot gets. The more people are trying to play six drops, the better this is because it punishes them even if they discard lands. The faster the format is, the worse it gets. So Right. By the way, this next card is is really one of the big stories uh, for us limited players for, for M20. It's Murder. And murder is one black black for an instant destroy target creature. So that's going to be your best instant it's speed removal spell. Premium uncommon that. removal. What? But it's a common, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it's so insane. Like this is the big deal because disfigures uncommon and murder's common. Like what's going right. on here? Right. So in in M thirteen when when um, murder was first printed, it was a common, but they quickly moved it to uncommon in Eldritch Moon Corset twenty nineteen. Uh, and so it basically since that first printing, it's been uncommon and now it's back to common. This is a, this is the winds changing, right? This is now two sets in a row that we've had absolutely premium instant speed removal at common and murder is one of the best removal spells they've ever printed at common for, for limited players. Um, it's, it's no doom blade, but you know, it's getting there. It's close. I mean, it's just like not splashable doom blade or whatever, right? I, this card is really like especially in recent history just one of the best so would you give it a so, b or a b plus i give it a b plus yeah i, I like it that. might I even think, be an a minus like double blacks a little rough. i don't think like, it's I a think, minus it's just not yeah. like that efficient even though it's very good it's it is still three man when we talk You're about right. a level cards we're talking murderous cut one man removal but yep but i mean yeah that, i'm, I'm taking fun. murder over gravedigger or gruesome scourger yeah it's a b plus B plus for murder. And again, I, you know, I want to know what we're doing next. Are, are we back to this world again? Like did no, are, you can are just... five mana sorcery speed, three black, black, you get a little bit of a bonus to destroy target creature. Is, are those days over? Well, the thing is it can just vary set to set. It, what happens in one set doesn't have to imply what's going to happen in the next set. Yeah, that's true. Except for that. It hasn't right. Like it's been six years since we've seen any set have a, a common murder level thing, you know, any normal set. Well, I mean, we, no, we, we saw the cycle of push commons and war that were pretty close. I think like well, Omnix was, my, Omnix that, was that cruelty. Was, that was my point though. Like the last two sets okay. have had. You're talking about before the last two sets. Gotcha, gotcha. Right. Exactly. And so like that, and that's why I'm wondering if like, like are we going to see lightning strike in this set? I don't know if it's in here. I didn't look, but like, wow, that's you know, not doing any sort of due diligence. I see. Yeah, yeah, we we, we have Sh- Chandra's Outrage and uh, some yeah. Uncommons. So those are kind of in the middle. Yeah. Well, anyway, we'll keep an eye on it shock and also. keep you updated. But All B right. plus so for murder. B plus and- for murder. And then mm-hmm. Noxious Grasp is one in a black. It's an instant at Uncommon. Destroy target creature or planeswalker that's green or white. You gain a life. Mm. So it's this is card. basically the same as the other color hosers we've seen. Uh, it's a good sideboard card. It's like a sideboard B, but you really shouldn't main deck it. Yeah, and and it is funny because depending on how the format plays out, sometimes these cards actually can be main deckable. But f- for a starting point, definitely sideboard for Noxious Grasp. Next, you mentioned a minute ago, Sanitarium Skeleton. 
It's a uh, black for a 1-2 skeleton at common, and you can pay 2 and a black. Return it from your graveyard to your hand. So by itself, it's not efficient enough. It's just too slow because a 1-mana one 1-2 one just doesn't do enough, and paying 3-mana mm -hmm. to get it back is, is kind of a lot. But mm -hmm. once you start playing a deck with Bone Splinters, uh, other token incentives, sacrifice cards, it gets a little more interesting. If you mill this with uh, the Gorging Vulture, you can then just get to bring it back, so you're kind of up a card there. Yep. So uh, I think Sanitarium Skeleton's a build around, but it's like a build around C plus. Yeah, and it's funny because it's an enabler. Like it, you don't actually build around it as much as it goes into it. It, it enables other uh, synergies, but it is a basically a purely synergy card. The only really viable thing that you can do with it, just at straight up face value, is in the late game you can chump block with it and keep doing that to act as kind of a, a, a force field. You know, keep keeping back one of your opponent's big ground creatures with no evasion. Uh, Sorcery of the Fang is next, or excuse me, Sorcerer of the Fang is next. It's one and a black for a one, three human wizard at common. And it has an activated ability of five and a black tap it. Sorcerer of the Fang deals two damage to target opponent or planeswalker. So this is one of those, uh, you know, gets on the board early chills. And then later in the game, you just start pumping mana into it. Guards. Yeah. It's for, fine. For a, for a not huge effect, but a, a significant yeah. one. It's a C minus. Like you're never going to feel yeah. too bad about playing it, but it's really not great. Yeah, the, the main deal here is that you got to want a, a two drop, especially a defensive two drop. That that, and then you'll kind of free roll the other part. But this rarely should be your win condition. So C minus for Sorcerer of the Fang. You mentioned this before a couple times now because it is really powerful. Soul Salvage, two and a black sorcery at common return up to two tar creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. Look, this is just core black flavor here at this point, right? And and again, the gorging vulture you mentioned it with just keeps going up higher and higher. Soul Salvage seems really powerful to me. I think the first Soul Salvage is a card you're going to really be interested in this format. Yeah, I, I believe that there's enough support. Uh, the Gorging Vulture is a big part of that. Uh, these, the various creatures that want to sacrifice themselves or die are a part of that. I, I think Soul Salvage is a C plus. I, I think the first, the first one is going to be important. They, they don't tend to get better in multiples. The decks that have like two or three Gorging Vultures will just play two and be fine. But, mm -hmm. you know, you, 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 I think you're going to end up being pretty happy when you have a, your first Soul Salvage. Yeah, it's just really one of the more powerful late game things you can do. Draw two creatures, basically. Um, next is Thought Distortion. It's four black black for a sorcery at Uncommon. It can't be countered. And it says target opponent reveals their hand. Exile all non-creature, non-land cards from that player's hand and graveyard. Nope. I'm off of this one for sure. This yeah. seems like maybe some type of constructed thing, but I don't there's even two think things. it's going to get hit there, honestly. Okay, um, yeah, maybe against some specific deck, but the the deal here is is pretty simple. There's two major knocks on this card. One of them is that it's six mana, so your opponent probably has emptied most of their hand out anyway by then. And the other one is that it doesn't hit creatures, and in limited creatures are what counts. So not being able to take away any creatures. Also just, it, so. What are you having in their hand after? After you've yeah. spent a six mana spell, like oh, I don't, right. yeah, I think it's just an F. it's an F. It's an F. Thought distortion is an F. Do not play it. Uh, Undead servant is next. It's three and a black for a three two zombie at common. When it enters the battlefield, you get a two two black zombie creature token for each card named Undead servant in your graveyard. Well, I, again, the self mill graveyard centric thing is going. And look, it's a four mana three two. It's not where you want to be, but. It does die and trade off. And then if you have another one, you're kind of getting value. Uh, if you combine it with the Gorging Vulture or something like that, you can kind of do it. But the, the, the problem is, is that you have to put Undead Servant in your deck. Like you have to draw them sometimes. That's that's the downside to it. Yeah, I, I think that you're not going to be very happy when you play a four mana three two, right? It just doesn't do much. No. The, second, no. the second one is good and the third one's great. But the first one's so bad and they're so clunky that I don't – well, you know, I don't think it's really worth going for unless you have a lot of – wow, Gorgian Vulture is just becoming a really it, it's so good. integral part of yeah. this. Because if you play a Vulture and mill an Undead Servant, now your second one is already kind of on a free roll. Like you're already happy yes, with it. Yes, it is. You're already getting – And you do have a lot of ways four. to get it back. So imagine, you know, you play the, the Vulture and you mill multiple of these. You can then like Soul Savage one of them back plus something mm -hmm. else. Yeah, I still am skeptical that this is the best thing that you want to be doing, but there's some power here for sure. Um, I, I would start Undead Servant off at, at a C. Uh, I'm not, 
I'm not going to try to draft seven undead servants. I mean, that's just seven four drops, <laughs> right? But 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 there's there is something here, uh, and this is a playable card, I think for sure. So I, I would say C for undead servant. Yeah, I like undead servant at C as well. All right, uh, unholy indenture is next. It is two and a black for an enchantment or a common it enchants a creature. When the creature dies, return that card to the battlefield under your control with a plus one plus one counter on it. I hate cards like this. I never play these type of cards. Yeah, it's the the sort of thing that's like it's supposed to be good against removal, but it's bad against exile removal. It's bad against passivism. It's bad against bounce. So bad against instant speed removal if they respond to it. I, it's, it's, I think it's I think it's an F. Like just yeah, like no. you could sideboard it against someone who is only like destruction, like all, the all murder deck. Yeah, or they're red green or whatever. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I'm just not that into uh, it, it. Just the the payoff is a lot is so far away from when you cast this. Yeah. Like sometimes they just I, might ignore know, it too. I think the interesting comparison here is unholy indenture to soul salvage. And I would rather have soul salvage 10 times out of 10, right? This yeah, is a way not, it not says, close. okay, if my creature dies, I get it back. Sure. You don't get a plus one, plus one counter, but you get two creatures back with soul salvage. So I really, I'm going to say F on unholy indenture. I just don't think you should put this card in your deck. And I think if you never put it in your deck, you would be doing yourself a favor over the course of the format, even if there's a oh, few I to- I totally choice agree. circumstances. Okay. Next is vampire of the dire moon. It's black for a one, one vampire with death touch and lifelink. And it's uncommon. Yeah, this card. I kind of like it. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll honestly, I'll, I'll just play black for a one, one death toucher. Like that's, that's already, a card I so, put in my So that's deck. already good enough. And then adding lifelink to it means like, you know, you, you have the situation a lot, right? They have like a three, three, out. you have one, one, one death toucher and you attack them. And they're just like, whatever, I'll take one. Now this punishes them for that. It actually, mm-hmm. it makes them, uh, you know, want to block it a little bit more. It makes your raids dead better. It also works with all the like uh, life gain stuff. There's a ton of life gain matter stuff, a hugely supported deck here. So, uh, yes, <laughs> you, you love the deck. Yeah, of course I love it. No, but I, I think, <laughs> I think this is rightfully an uncommon and it is, uh, fairly strong. Like, yeah, th- th- I agree. Th- this, this, you know, this isn't as good as murder, but not very much is. But I think it's on par with like disfigure. Yeah, maybe. I, I have it at like C plus. Like, look, I, I view it as a one one death toucher for one mana that happens to have lifelink, which is not super relevant on it, but is a nice bonus. So what would I give a one one death touch? I'd give it like a C minus or a C, and I'd probably give Vampire of the Dire Moon a C. I, I look, you have to augment it to make the lifelink really and meaningful. It, the thing is I think one mana one one death touch is a C, and I think lifelink adds a, a pretty good like it's a very synergistic combo here. Also, when mm-hmm. we're looking at all these raised deads, the fact that you have a, a creature based removal spell that you can just keep trading off, like this is yeah. super good with soul salvage because it trades off for it really one, is, for, for yeah. one mana, yeah, and then you get it back, and then you get to cast it for one mana. I, I think it's a yeah. B minus. I think it's very good. Okay, I'm giving it a C. I, I think you're overrating lifelink. Like if I if this was literally black for a one one death touch, what would you give it? A C. A C. And you think that the one life you occasionally gain when it blocks, or if you get to attack with it once, is worth a grade and a half, or you know, a full grade or something? I I don't understand that. I think it's, it's, it's really it's, just a one one it, death. It's touch worth right? about half a grade. Because okay, I I don't give it on a one power creature. I don't. I don't. I just think you know, it, I think it's going to add up. Maybe a one mana one one death touch is a C plus in this format, though. Yeah, it could be, or Maybe. especially in black yeah. here. Yeah. All right, let's go C plus on vampire. Of yeah, the let's Dire go. Moon. Let's go B minus on vampire of the Dire Moon. <laughs> Vengeful War Chief is four and a black for a four four orc warrior and uncommon. Whenever you lose life for the first time each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on it. I'm not like super what? into this because. Basically, you 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 have this. They hit you with a flyer, and it just becomes a five five. Like mm-hmm. it's it's yeah. good in a race, but it's just kind of clunky. And then if your opponent does have control over this, unless you have life payment cards, it is kind of a combo with those. But I, yeah, I think I think Ventral War Chief's like a C minus. Me too. I, I'm not really excited about this card. Uh, even if you have your own life loss uh, built in, it's still not amazing. So C minus for Vengeful War Chief. That brings us to our last black card. It's Yarox Fenlurker. This is black, black for an uncommon 1-1 one, one horror. And it says when Yarox uh, Fenlurker enters a battlefield, each opponent exiles a card from their hand. And then you can pay two and a black to give it plus one, plus one until end of turn. 
I like Dang. this card. This is that's nice. Ravenous rats uh, that, that's been hitting the gym. You know, it, it <laughs> like yeah. it, it exiles, so it, you know gets around. They can't discard a creature and soul salvage it back. Uh, though you can't then necromancer it either. So I guess it kind of uh, isn't all upside. But it's a two mana one one that gives you a two for one, assuming the body that it leaves behind is something good, which it kind of is because two in a black. It, it, all of a sudden, it trades up for something. Yeah, uh, another it's, it's, the body's medium, but whatever you're getting yeah. a card uh, spot, it's so you get it's a free the roll. yeah you get the card up front, and then and it's good to soul salvage like everything else. So I think Yurox Fenlurker is probably a C plus. Yeah, me too. C plus for the Fenlurker. That card's good. 